Gemar Chatima Tova. What happens when over 200 rabbis walk into a room? It does sound like the beginning of a bad joke, but it is my reality for most summers when I go to Jerusalem to study with rabbis from all different denominations and from all over the world. So to follow that joke format though, when the classes are done and the rabbis walk into a bar, <laughs> what do they talk about? Talmud, Torah, Tanakh, not so much. <laughs> Mishnah, Midrash, Midot, not really. We talk about you. <laughs> yes, we talk about our congregations and our communities. Over the years, I've heard some unbelievable stories. Some are heartbreaking and sad. And these stories remind me how fortunate I am to serve at a community like Adat Ariel. I also hear inspirational and beautiful stories. This past summer, with the encampments on campus, the Hillel rabbis were the focus of attention. I was particularly interested in hearing from Rabbi Yona Hain, the rabbi at Columbia University. Rabbi Hain, who is both incredibly approachable and wicked smart, told me about an odd request made, from, made uh, to a, um, a member of the Columbia University Jewish Studies faculty. It was from one of his students over Passover. Remember, the encampments were in full swing when Pesach came about. An anti-Zionist Jewish student from the encampment contacted this Jewish studies professor with a request. That evening, the student wanted to lead a Pesach Seder in the encampment, but didn't have the shank bone for the Seder. The student wondered if the faculty member could provide the shank bone. You can't make that up. So what would you do? Would you give a shank bone to a satyr in an anti-Israel encampment? I spent a lot of time thinking about this issue. It begs us to consider a range of things. What is the role of anti-Zionists in the Jewish community, in our social circles, in our families, by extension, what about those who aren't anti-Zionists but are staunch critics of Israel? Our approach to these scenarios are telling of a larger point about our approach to Judaism and perhaps even life in general. So there are lots of layers, and that's what this sermon is about. What I would do in this situation and why. As a rabbi, instead of focusing on what is not allowed and what cannot be done, I am much more interested in thinking about how we can encourage people to do more and celebrating those steps. Instead of consternation and scorn for what you may not be observing, I see my role as a rabbi to meet you where you are in life with appreciation of what you decide to do Jewishly and with encouragement and support for taking further steps. Some are critical of this approach, calling it minimalist, lowest common denominator Judaism. I see it a little differently. The Talmud teaches that after the brilliant scholar Elisha ben Abuya became a heretic and left Judaism, his one-time student, Rebbe Meir, retained a close relationship with his former teacher. Many people in the Jewish community questioned that relationship 
and wondered if the teachings of Rabbi Meir were rendered illegitimate because they were taught to him by the heretical Elisha ben Abuya. But the Talmud defends Rabbi Meir with a teaching that very much speaks to my soul. When Rabbi Meir found a pomegranate, he ate the fruit and threw away the peel. Tocho achal klipato zarak. For every fruit, there is a peel, a core, a stem. For every flower, there is a thorn. And so in life, we have a decision. Are we going to forget the fruit? Or are we wisely, judiciously, going to follow the example of Rebbe Meir and separate that which should be tossed from that which should be treasured? Tocho achal klipato zarak, eating the fruit and tossing the peel. This idea shapes my approach as a rabbi. I remember one year, a family called me on the way to the airport for their spring break vacation at a resort. Every year, they explained, on the last night at the resort, they have a big family dinner. They just realized that this particular year, the night of the dinner was Pesach, and they hoped to turn the vacation dinner into a Passover Seder. They wondered, could I loan them some Haggadahs so that they could take them on the trip and use them for the Seder? Sounds great, I told them, no problem. But Rabbi, they continued, the Seder's gonna be at an Italian restaurant <laughs> with pasta and garlic bread. Here was a family going out of their way to turn a carb-loaded Italian feast into a Passover Seder. Tocho achal klipato zarak. Eat the fruit, toss the peel. I happily loaned them my Haggadahs. So if I can give a family Haggadah for a family Seder over garlic bread and pasta, should I also be willing to provide a shank bone to a college student in an encampment? Or are there times when there is too much peel and not enough fruit? Are there times when the thorns surrounding a flower would cut too deeply? Is this shank bone request one of those times? To answer that question, I want to share with you my relationship to Israel. The author Michael Wex jokes that what Jews do best is complain. As a people, he writes, we are born to kvetch. And there are plenty of things to kvetch about in Israel. There are the annoying things, the cigarette smoke, the overpowering cologne, the lack of personal space, and that the whole country seems to have forgotten one of the very first Hebrew words that most of us learn, bevakasha, please. <laughs> that joke also works for slicha, excuse me. <laughs> there are also the real things to fetch about, and we can all list those things. But for some reason, while everyone in Israel is born to fetch, for many years, we American Zionists taught that Israel was beyond reproach. Israel was simply the best and the greatest. Disneyland with falafel. <laughs> of course it's not. Because Disneyland is not magical. It's imaginary, and Israel is real, a real country with real people, with real accomplishments, and also, yes, with real problems. In Israel, like in every other country in the world, there is plenty to fetch about. 
And while Israel is far from perfect, like no other place on earth, it summons my soul. I stand in amazement and wonder that a new Jewish future is being written in the very same place that thousands of years ago the stories of the Torah were first told. About 120 years ago, Theodore Herzl published a novel that served as a foundational text for Zionism. The book was called Alt Neuland, Old New Land. Old New Land, the building of a new home for Jews amidst the remains of our ancient home. Old New, in Hebrew, Tel Aviv. Old New. This past summer in Israel, I woke up early one day and I walked over to the old city to put our preschoolers' notes in the Kotel. That morning, a small group of men held on to one another and stood by the wall. And while caressing the ancient wall of our temple from 2,000 years ago, they cried for a relative that fell in Gaza. After leaving the Kotel, I took a train to Tel Aviv and stood in front of a new concrete wall filled with graffiti art and stickers commemorating those lost since October 7th. As they walked by, some people paused in front of the wall and wrote something on it. Others just touched the wall. Most had tears in their eyes. Two walls, one ancient, one new, both serving as sites of Jewish emotion, filled with prayers, gratitude, hope, and sadness. Old, new. Tel Aviv. For me, the pull of the past and present, the Tel and the Aviv, is very compelling. And if I'm being honest, there's not one day that goes by that I don't wonder if I made a mistake. After 2,000 years of exile, our people are home writing the greatest chapter of Jewish history while I live in America? Am I in the wrong place? I live with that question every day. And while at least for now, America is my home, my relationship to Israel is sacred. I say that knowing when it comes to Israel, I too, and born to Kfetch, because Israel is not Disneyland with falafel. Israel has many serious flaws. Being a Zionist is working to challenge Israel to, more, to fully live up to our ideals, whatever our ideals may be. We should challenge Israel in discussion and debate, and we should improve Israel with difficult decisions and compromise. But what makes constructive criticism constructive is the intention. Constructive criticism is made with a desire to be helpful, not hurtful. For me, that's the line. Criticism of Israel offered with a desire to improve the country is an act of love. It should be accepted and even celebrated even when we disagree with it. But criticism intended to be harmful, that for me crosses the line. I can hear lots of people say lots of things about Israel, but at the end of the day, I need to know that those offering the critique maintain a fidelity to the idea of Israel serving as a sovereign Jewish homeland a principle so beautifully stated in the Hatikva, liot am chofshi be'artzenu, to be a free people in our land. 
for me, that's the line. What I saw in the encampments with the chants from the river to the sea, led by people who openly advocate for violent uprisings, sponsored by people who call for the death of Jews, the intent of the encampments was not the improvement of Israel, but rather the eradication of Israel. And I will not be party to my own people's destruction. This all leads me back to the question over the Seder. No, I would not give the shank bone for the encampment Seder. That's not the end of my answer, however, because we still need to talk about the student. Many of us know people like this. They are our children or our children's friends. They are our grandchildren. They were at Jewish summer camp with us. They went to Jewish schools with us. They work with us. Some are probably sitting here tonight. And I know many of us here have felt pain. The pain of seeing a loved one take an anti-Israel position that is so difficult to, for us to understand, never mind accept. What do we do? What should be our relationship with someone who seeks the shank bone but sits in the encampments? Which is really asking, what should be our relationship with those who embrace Judaism but shun Israel? Over the past year, so many of you shared personal struggles about struggles you've had with friends, relatives, and children over Israel. I've been both moved and humbled that you sought my advice. And I feel for you because it is tough, I know. A few things I want to say that may prove helpful. I cannot say this enough. Supporting Israel does not always mean agreeing with the direction Israel is headed. Zionism is not monolithic. There are and always have been radically diverse ideas on what Israel should aspire to be. That diversity of thought is not a challenge, it's a blessing. To offer a local example, we have an American flag that hangs outside our home. And that flag is going to stay up there regardless of who wins the election next month. Look, expecting to find uniform agreement with our friends, spouses, and children on tough issues like Israel is simply an unrealistic expectation. If you want to continue embracing the person, embrace disagreement. If the disagreement makes everyone disagreeable, drop the topic and talk about the Dodgers. <laughs> now, if there is someone in your life that you love who is an anti-Zionist, meaning they don't believe in Israel's right to exist, choosing between Israel and someone we love is a Sophie's choice that will only result in pain and loss. Don't back yourself into that corner. Save the pro-Israel arguments for the world. Save hugs for the people that you love. As for anti-Zionists who are not part of our inner circle, like the student at Columbia, Here's my perspective. When Rabbi Hain asked me about this situation, I told him I wouldn't provide the shank bone for the encampment, but I would extend an invitation, an invitation to the student to join me and my family at our home for Seder. Of course, I know that that student would likely never come and may even find the invitation patronizing but my invitation would absolutely be authentic. Remember Rabbi Meir? 
In another volume of the Talmud, we learn that Rabbi Meir was bullied by some local hooligans. Being beaten up day after day began to get to the rabbi until one day he put on his talit and tefillin and began to pray for the death of his tormentors. His wife, Bruria, she saw what was happening and immediately intervened. She reminded Rabbi Meir that the Bible doesn't say, let the sinners be consumed from the earth. Instead, and quite deliberately, the Bible says, let sin be consumed from the earth. Rabbi Meir realized that his wife, Broria, was right. And instead of praying for their demise, the rabbi began to pray for compassion for the hooligans. This Talmudic text is the Jewish version of hate the sin, love the sinner. This would be my approach with anti-Zionist Jews. I abhor, firmly reject, and will fight with all the spirit in my soul against anti-Zionist institutions, organizations, philosophies, and movements. And to the Jews in their midst, my arms remain open. Besides, I think we're going to have a far greater chance in changing a Jewish anti-Zionist perspective on Israel when we're seated together over a meal rather than yelling at one another while standing at opposing sides of rallies. I wish the world were different. I wish Israel was able to push peace instead of being forced to wage war. And I am cautiously hopeful that one day, while maybe not in my lifetime, but hopefully in the lifetime of my children, this conflict will be put to an end. There has been too much lost, too much innocent blood, too many shattered dreams, too much sadness for Jews and Palestinians. I hold out hope for something better, at least eventually. And while I know it may be naive, I also know to be Jewish is to hold on to hope despite the presence of darkness. When the time of peace finally arrives and Israel is a country with regular fetching, I hope that the encampments and shouts from the river to the sea will be a distant memory for all of our people, especially the next generation. And when the next generation arrives, when the future becomes the present, and those who are currently in school are off living their own lives, I hope they will still enjoy loving relationships with both their family and faith, and that they would look forward to coming together for Pesach Seder. And at that Seder, with love in their hearts, I hope they proudly read the same words with which we as a people have concluded our Passover Seders for generations and feel oddly appropriate for us today on this Yom Kippur next year in Jerusalem, L'Shana Haba'ah B'Yerushalayim, Gemar Chatima Tovah.